So, you know, maybe we should open the Bible up. What do you think? Yeah, let's do that. All right, so we're in the book of Exodus again. Week number three. Week number three in the book of Exodus. And what we've seen is God's people in Egypt. Like, why in Egypt, right? Because they're there to protect from a famine. They, they, they're there. They're there for a long time. It's not the promised land, though. Uh, eventually the Pharaoh becomes scared of them, it begins to subjugate them, begins to enslave them, right? He orders, uh, eventually he's so scared that he decides that um, he needs to take care of their future fighting men. And so uh, he wants all the male-born children to die. Pretty bad, right? We talked about that the last two weeks, especially last week. Um, He wants them to die. And when it doesn't work to get the midwives to do it, uh, he just gives an order that they're all going to be thrown into the Nile. That's what's going to happen. So, uh, last week we looked at Moses' birth and his mom and his sister and Pharaoh's daughter and how God comes in through those people to rescue Moses because God has a plan for Moses. And again, I, I hope I'm not ruining anything. I think you know the end of the story, right? That Moses was the one that God used to deliver e- uh, Israel out of Egypt. Um, but... And, and that calling was on his life, and he had some sense of that calling. You know, when he's 40 years old, and he goes out, and he sees an Egyptian abusing an Israelite, and I think, I don't know what he's thinking. You know, I'm going to take care of him one at a time, or I'm just seeing an injustice, and I have to do that. And so he kills, he kills the Egyptian, and then it's found out. And then he's got to run. And so we see Moses fleeing and settling in Midian. Midian he finds safety. He finds work. He finds a wife. A um, lot of things there. A lot of things there. A lot of things talked about. A lot of people talked about. Um, but one person isn't mentioned in that whole time, and that's God. Actually, he's implied, obviously, through the scriptures in that period of time of him working, but not mentioned directly. And, and, and you know, by the way, not mentioned directly for 430 years. In a, in a span of scripture. Now, that's just two chapters in the Bible, but 430 years. So, but we're going to see God today. And we're going to talk about Moses' call, but we're going to talk about that next week. This morning, I want to take a view of God and, and what he does and what it talks about God and, and how that interacts with our life. So that's what we're going to do today because it does apply to us today. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to the book of Exodus chapter 2 toward the end of that, verse 23. And we're going to talk about this God who sees us and who's with us and who is, is there. All right, like I said, so we're going, to, we're going to talk about Moses, but really, and even today you're going to hear his name. But next week we're going to talk about that calling and how God uses that instrument to do that. But, um, but this morning we're going to talk about God. So where are we? All right, so um, again, time marches on in Scripture. I've told you, you know, one of the problems I have with Scripture in a sense of, you know, time marches. And, and, and so, you know, beginning of chapter 1 to beginning of chapter 2 is 40 years. I mean, actually, it's 80 years. Um, 40 years to when he kills the Egyptian. 40 more years he is in Midian living a life. You know, the, the past life is all but forgotten. Not forgotten because misses his family, I'm sure, misses people. He can't see what is familiar, but 40 years. 40 years has gone by. Um, you know, it was 40 years ago that, that he was in Egypt, and, and he's been in Midian that whole time. So um, he's about to be reminded that God is still active. And that God still has a plan for his life and for his people's life, um, which is good news. And that's good news, like I said, for them, but it's also good news for us. So look at what happens. All right, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Uh, Read along with me while I read. It says, Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and that the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, that, and they cried out, and their cry for help, and, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. Um, so 
So they're struggling. So, you know, Moses isn't, you know, we, we talked about this last week. He's in the wilderness, right? Wilderness isn't a bad place. Often it's a place that we can meet with God or that God can show us what we need to know. You know, I don't know if any of you did that study in, in wilderness this week. If you didn't, go ahead, go study wilderness in the scripture and see how God meets us there. Um, but, um, and, and, you know, but he's got a job. He's got a wife. He's got a family, right? He's got security. He's, he's doing all right. The, the people of Israel are still in slavery. And it's not getting any better. It's getting worse. Um not getting any better, it's getting worse. Matter of fact, it says, you know, that the king dies, and, and that is the king most likely that chased uh, um, Moses out of Egypt, right? So he dies, but it says in Scripture that the people sigh or they groan. Um, they groan. <laughs> Literally, that's what it means in the, in the Hebrew, is that they groan or they moan about it. Um, in other words, there was no relief. You know, I, I don't know if you ever had a bad time or you're living under a bad administration or you're living under a bad something and when someone's in power and you think, oh my goodness, anybody would be better than them. And then somebody else gets in office and you're like, oh my goodness, they're worse than them. Right? <laughs> but that's what happens when you're in it you're just like, man, anything to take it away, anything to make it better, anything's got to be better than that. And I, and I can imagine, doesn't say it in Scripture, I can imagine they were waiting for this king who murdered their children to die. <laughs> but it says they sigh. They groan in that and they cry out to God. Um, because, see, their situation was bad and we're not talking about politicians here. We're talking, and we're not talking about bosses at work. We're talking about slave masters. Who, who and, and again, slavery was different back then, but they owned their lives. That's what we're talking about. And so, we're going to look at some stuff specifically about God, but when we walk into that, we first got to realize, and, and Scripture says it all over the place, that life is hard. Life is hard, and people hurt. We hurt. You know, matter of fact, one of, the, one of the sad things in the Christian church today is that sometimes we feel like we've got to walk in with a big smile on our face like everything's all right all the time. Praise God. Praise God. I had, used to have a guy <laughs> in one of my churches, um, a staff member, who used to always say, if it was any better... If it was any better, I would explode. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I know your life. And, and so I would just always answer him, well, I hope it doesn't explode because it's going to make a mess. And uh, it, it, it did make a mess, by the way, <laughs> right, because things did explode. But I went in some senses. But life is hard. That's the reality of that. Jesus said to us, in this world, you will have tribulation. It's not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, in the Christian church, sometimes we preach the gospel, and when we preach the gospel, we tell them, come to Jesus, and he'll make everything better. And then somebody says, okay, okay, Jesus, I know I need something. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. That's what they're telling me. I need Jesus. And then not everything gets better. I mean, Jesus is going to take care of your biggest issue, which is your sin problem. But that doesn't mean that everything's going to go away. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick and die. That doesn't mean that the person that you love is not going to get, stay sick and die. It doesn't mean that your boss is going to get better or that the administration is going to change. It doesn't mean that you're going to get a job or lose a job or whatever that kind of stuff means. It doesn't mean that everything's going to get better. I like to say, God, like the old song, and if you, if you're, if you remember this, you're old. Um, you know, God never promised us a rose garden. Yeah, somebody got it. <laughs> he never did, though. I mean, he promised us heaven. Praise the Lord. And as a matter of fact, if he made this earth too good, would we want to stay here? Too many of us want to stay here, and it looks like this now. How crazy is that? 
right? So there's real pain. There's real suffering. It's happening, you know, 80 years now we're talking since the order to kill kids. I don't know how long that lasted. I don't know if it continued to last. I don't know what was going on. But I know that they were in subjugation. I know that they were in slavery. I know they were groaning out in pain to their God. I love the song by Casting Crowns. Um, it, it starts out, I, I would have thought by now that the rain would have stopped, but here I am and it's still raining. And the song is, I'll praise you in the storm. Because sometimes the storm keeps raging. And for them, it was raging. It was raging. And for some of you, it's raging. Why? Why is it raging? Why is life so hard? Life is so hard because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that has fallen. And we hurt because of all sorts of things, sometimes because of uncontrollable circumstances. <coughs> it's nobody's fault. It's, it's nobody's fault of, of why somebody is sick or why somebody is hurting or why something is happening, it's just uncontrollable out of our circumstances. It's not because of anybody in particular. It's just because. Um, sometimes it's because of foolish choices. Because of choices that we make um, and, and impulses that we, that we act on in times that we shouldn't. Sometimes it's because of sin, whether it's our sin or somebody else's sin upon us. Right? We live in a broken world, and in a broken world, there is pain, and there is hurt, and it hurts. Okay? So that's where we are. But, but this is where we need to see this, because there there's a beautiful thing here in the, in, in the Scriptures. Um, four verbs are used to talk of God in the next two verses. Four verbs that are vitally important for us to catch. Look at what he says. Verse 24. So they cry out because of their bondage, and it rose up to God. And it says, so God heard their groaning. God hears. God hears. And that's what it says. First, he hears them. He, he hears their prayers. He hears what they're saying. He hears their groaning. He hears what's happening. He hears the cries of desperation. God hears. And I don't know if you're like me, because I've had times in my life when I felt like I'm praying out, and all my prayers are doing is bouncing off the ceiling. And although theologically I, I, I understand, experientially I don't. And, I'm, and sometimes I'm like, God, are, are you there? Are you, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You know, I think sometimes we think, can, can God really hear? I mean, so, like, if we all pray, so, um, so we, we have friends in Uganda, right? And so when we pray in America, or at least in, in our cultural setting in, at Grace Gospel Church, when we pray, we pray one at a time so that everybody can join into the amen. Um, it was shocking to me at first, right? And some of you are smiling because you've had the Ugandan kids in your house, right? It was shocking to me the first time they said, I don't remember if it was with everybody, if it was in our house when I had the kids, in, you know, some of the kids in my house. And they're like, all right, we're going to pray. So everybody prays. And then everybody starts praying. Like all of them. They're praying out to God. They're crying out to God. They're, they're, they're each speaking to God. And, and it's this, just this mumble of stuff. And, and, and the American is sitting there going, I guess I'll join in. No, let me pray. Right? So here's what's really cool. You know that God hears you like I hear you when we pray individually, but God hears you when we all pray at the same time. He hears every person. It's not indistinguishable to him, even though it's indistinguishable to you and I. It is not indistinguishable to him. Right? He, he's not like us. We'll talk about that in a minute, but he's, he's not a man. There's not too much noise out there for him to kind of get it all. God doesn't get headaches. Right? God doesn't get headaches. 
Sometimes I'm like, oh, too much noise. (laughs) God's not like that. God hears us every time, every time, every time we pray, God hears us. He doesn't struggle. He's not too busy. He's not turned aside. He's not wondering, you know, oh my goodness, what do they want again? He hears you. How cool is that? Life's really hard. How good it is to know that God hears. All right, well, that's the first verb. Second verb, he says, is that God remembers. God remembers. Look at what it says. So he, God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I want you to, I, I need you to stop for a second. It's not like he forgot. Not like it's been, wait, 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 430 years ago, all right, longer than 430 years ago, I made a promise. Now, what was that? You know, he's not a man. He's not thinking like you and I. He remembers. He knows what he has promised. God has made a promise to his people, and he's going to keep it. Matter of fact, I love what it talks about because it doesn't talk about a promise there. It talks about a covenant. God has made a covenant with his people, which means that it's going to happen. Troy and Michaela are going to covenant together in marriage. Before God. You know, too often, and we see this in our world today, right? We make all kinds of promises in marriage, and then we don't like those things that we see in marriage anymore, and we drop it. God is not like a man. Praise God. I'm so thankful that he's not like us. He's not like us. I love what Expositor's commentary said. It said, God was pleased to respond even to their first lists of faith as they cry out to God. But he was also moved by his own word that he promised the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God isn't forgetful. God knows who he is. And and, and he knows what he promised. And by the way, he knows your place in that promise. (laughs) He knows your place in that promise. That that with Christ comes everything. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that we receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. At the moment of our salvation, you receive everything that you're going to receive. Everything. You say, well, wait, 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 I, I thought I was going to get more. No, no, you already got it. You say, well, wait. I'm not living on heaven. No, no, no. But it's yours today. I mean, yes, you're not there yet. You're going to go home one day, praise the Lord. But it's yours now. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've accepted Christ for what he's done for you on the cross and put it all into that, put all your hope, everything into Christ You are part of his story now. You are his child, part of his history, part of his promise, part of his covenant. God knows your place in there. He knows that they're all yours right now. And that means he doesn't forget about you. That that means that he doesn't forget about what he's promised or, or... or what you will get in Christ. Doesn't mean everything's going to work out the way you think it should. God doesn't ask us for our opinion. We've talked about that. But praise the Lord. He hears us and he remembers. Amen? All right. Well, not only that, but look at what it says in the next verse. God saw the sons of Israel. God sees us. <coughs> now, I'm only making a distinction because he uses a different verb there. (laughs) Right? God sees what is happening. He knows what is happening. He knows your struggle. He knows your suffering. He knows the pain that is there. By the way, he knows why it's there. He knows why, whether it's because of uncontrollable circumstances that he has allowed, whether it's because of foolish choices that you've made, whether it's because of sin that you've done or somebody else has done upon you, he knows why You are in that place. And he isn't looking away. 
and he isn't preoccupied, and there's not somebody else more important than you. I've talked with some of you, and I've said, I just don't feel like I'm that important. Like, why should God look on me? And listen, that's a great question. Right? I mean, why, why should God turn his face toward me? Why should God look upon me? But here's the hope of Scripture. See, even though I can't fully get it because I know me, I know how unfaithful I am at times, I know how, how I blow it at times, I know I go like, man, I would have given up on me a long time ago. But here's the good news. God doesn't give up on you. God doesn't roll his eyes even to the point that he looks away and says, I don't, I'm just done. No, God sees. God sees what is happening. He loves you and cares for you. Even though he is not bringing what you hope or even what he's going to bring at this moment, it's coming. Right? Romans 8, 28. But God is working all things out to the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, right? So that's position. Trust me, it is all about position in Christ and about you walking in that position, but he's working it out. I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes. For Moses, it was 40 years of working it out. Now, he had to work some stuff out of Moses, I think, right? He had to prepare Moses. 40 years. Was God still at work, though? Yep. God sees. There's never a time that God operates out of, and, and, and you need to see, God not only sees, but he, but he cares. And you need to know that God never operates ever outside of his love, even in his judgment. God operates in all that he is all the time, always together. All right, so God, life is hard. We know that life is hard, right? We know that God hears us and that he remembers. It says that God sees us, and then look at the last verb that he says, and God took notice of them. That, that word literally means he knows. And it's not just a knowledge of like, you know, I read it in a textbook and I kind of have some sort of knowledge. It's an intimate knowledge of what Christ knows about us. <laughs> um. The New Testament talks about that God knows every hair upon our head. He knows every hair upon our head. I know he knows me less than he knows some of you. Because I have less. I get that. But, and, and you go, okay, well, that's really cool. God, God knows every hair. No, 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 no. Think about that for a second. He knows where every hair is on your head. He knows you that intimately. That he knows where every hair is upon your head. Every one. He knows which one is gray and which one is natural. He knows which one was, was, was not gray but is, nat is not natural. <laughs> you may fool me, but you don't fool God. But he knows it all. Right? God knows. He took notice of them. He literally knows how cool it is to know that God knows how cool it is to know that God intimately knows my struggle. And he intimately knows what is happening to me. Intimately. Every detail. You, you haven't lo he hasn't lost you on the radar. He hasn't lost you on the radar. Well, why is that? Well, because God is not like a man. So I, I, I went through this in, my, in the Bible study on Tuesday. We'll, we'll go through it again. You'll, you'll know it, right? There's some things about God. So there's attributes of God which he has. Um, some of those are shared attributes. Um, we call them communicable and, and incommunicable attributes. So communicable being like you can pass them. So if you have a communicable disease, you can pass it, right? So it, 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 those are... Those are things that are like us, but they're also incommunicable. In other words, things that are just of God, that are not of anybody else. So love is a communicable attribute of God. We can love. We can even have hints and times where we love as God loves. In a beautiful commitment, an agape love, where you don't deserve it, but we love you anyway. 
Right? That's a, that's a beautiful, we can do that. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. And by being made in the image of God, that's not God calling, I hope. <laughs> or maybe I do hope it's God. I don't know. All right. He's going, go someplace else. Anyway. Um, all right. So there's some things. So incommunicable. Attributes of God, which are only God's attributes. And we need to know this because I do believe it will change your life. I, I really do. If you can grasp this. So they're the omnis. The first one is that God is omniscient. God is omniscient. What it means when we say God is omniscient, it means that he has limited, or limitless knowledge. Limit, God knows all things, past, present, and future. But he doesn't know all things that have happened or will happen. He knows all things that could have happened or could happen. He knows all there is to know and all that can be known. So not only does he know, it was explained to me like this in seminary. I think somebody did. So you come to a fork in the road. He not only knows which way you will take and what will happen when you take that, he also knows what the, the other way, what could happen and what would happen if you did take that way. Now you think about that. Why do I need to listen to God if he knows what could happen and would happen if I take that way, and he knows what will happen if I take this way. That's a good source to go to, right? See, he's not like us. We're not, we're limited in our knowledge. He is limitless in his knowledge. <laughs> Psalm 139 verses 1 through 3 say, oh God, you have searched me and known me. You know where I, when I sit, you know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. And he says this. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Limitless knowledge. All right, omniscience. Not only is he omnip uh, um, omniscient, he is omnipotent. Omnipotent, sovereign, all-powerful. Right, so scripture affirms that all power belongs to God. He's able to do anything that, that he desires to do that is not against his nature. He created the universe and all that we have that is physical by the speaking of his mouth. He didn't have to find um, uh, material that was there and then make it into something. He took what was not there and made something out of nothing. How cool is that? How cool is that, right? Um, Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. And then he says, nothing is too difficult for you. Pretty cool, right? Um, that's a guy you want on your side. All right. Omniscient, omnipotent. Not only that, but he's omnipresent. Omnipresent means to be ever-present. God is everywhere at all times. There's no location that he does not inhabit. Thus, you're never alone. And good or bad, you can never hide from God. You might be able to hide from me. You might be able to hide from your spouse, from your kids. Your kids might be able to hide from you. Nothing hides from God. Nothing. Right? So God is everywhere. Now, listen to me. This is not to be confused with systems that says that God is everything. God is not everything. He is completely distinct from his creation. But he sees everywhere. There's no place in his creation that you can go to outrun God. Now, why will that change your life? If you can even understand just the, the omnis, just, just the omnis. Now, he's eternal. He's never changing. Right? There's a few others. But if you could just understand these, it'll change your life. Why, why should I trust God? Well, if God knows all things, not only all things that will happen, but all things that could possibly happen, and if he's all powerful to be able to do something about what needs to be done, Right? And if he's ever present, so in other words, he's where I am at all times. He doesn't leave me. He doesn't forget about me. He doesn't stop seeing me. Then I can fully and absolutely trust that God. 
I guess the only other thing you have to understand is his holiness in that attribute. Because the only reason why you wouldn't trust him at that point is that you don't think he's good. See, if you believe these and you don't fully trust God in everything, then it must be because that you don't trust that he's got your best interest at heart or that he's out for your good. But we've already talked about scripture that says that he is, right? So if we'll, if we'll put it all in there, what we'll get is we'll get, um, we'll get God out. All right, so beautiful verses Right? These, these verses that are just kind of stuck in there and in this story. When I say story, I mean historical story. It really happened. Right? But inside of this, there's this interjection of God. That the people still groan because their situation hasn't changed and their cry rises to God. He hears, he remembers, he sees, and he knows. He takes notice of them. He knows what is happening. And then what we see in Scripture is that God acts. Now, I want to remind you because the problem is that it's the next verse. I know it's a different chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, but it's, a, it's the next verse. And sometimes we think, yeah, see, in Scripture, God acted right away. <laughs> remind you, 80 years between chapter one, I mean, chapter 2, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 1, 80 years, 40 years in the desert, in the wilderness for Moses, all right? It gets worked out in time. So how is he going to act? What's he going to do? <coughs> verse 3, now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. All right, so God meets Moses physically in the wilderness. Now, I'm going to tell you, God's been teaching Moses in the wilderness for 40 years. God has been teaching Moses. We'll talk about this more next week. But he's been teaching Moses for 40 years in the wilderness. And so he's going to get his attention. And how he gets his attention is by setting a bush ablaze. Now, that's not necessarily strange or miraculous, especially in a desert where things are bone dry and static electricity happens. My guess is, Moses had seen burning bushes before. All right, it's not strange or miraculous. The issue is the bush is not consumed. So it keeps burning, and it keeps burning, and it keeps burning, and it keeps burning. That is strange and miraculous, right? So he turns aside, and he goes to where that bush is because he wants to see this marvelous sight and why the bush is not burnt up makes all kind of sense. God gets him attention, his attention through doing the supernatural in natural, in the natural. Fire is not supernatural. The bush not burning up, supernatural. The, 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 you know, the, 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 um, the bush not being consumed, that's supernatural. That's God. Something's going on there. I got to go see what it is. So it's not about the bush. So look what happens. It said, when God saw that he had turned aside, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Here I am. And then he said, do not come near. For the, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground. So he, he says, take off your sandals. It's holy ground. <laughs> take off your sandals because... I'm speaking. Now, that's not a sanctuary right there. Um, the, you know, bushes aren't normally sanctuaries. Okay? It's not, it's not a place designated for God to show up, in other words. By the way, the church is not a place designated for God to show up in some, in some religious form. Like, you want to meet with God? Go to the church. 
Just like you want to meet with God, go to the temple. Used to be that way. No longer that way anymore. The presence of God doesn't dwell in one place. Matter of fact, any place you go with to dwell with God is a sanctuary. This right now is a sanctuary. If I didn't think your feet stunk, I might say take off your shoes. I'm only joking. <laughs> right? But, but it is. It's a sanctuary. This is a place because God is in the midst of us because we are gathered together amongst his people giving him glory. And our prayers are rising up to heaven before the throne of grace. And, and it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in that place where you shouldn't be, but you finally realize that you shouldn't be there and you turn your eyes to God. That becomes a sanctuary because God is there. Well, this is a sanctuary. God, God literally speaks to him out of that. <laughs> Take off your sandals. And then he identifies himself. He says in verse 6, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Now, he wasn't looking at God. He was looking at a fire. But he understood that God was in the midst of the fire. And then God shares with him, declares to him the actions that he's going to take based on what we know from earlier about the cries and the suffering. <coughs> Verse 7 says, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. Exactly what it says earlier on, right? I've seen them, the affliction of the people. I've given heed to their cry. I'm aware of their sufferings. I know what's going on. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from the land from up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression which the Egyptians are oppressing them. I love how many times he says that. I see it. I know it. I see it. I know it. I see it. I know it. Well, why didn't you act 80 years ago? When kids were being ripped from their mother's arms, being tossed into the Nile River. And you know what the answer is to that? I don't know. What I know is that it's God's timing. And that he knows what is right. And that his instrument of choosing was Moses. And so in that horrible situation, he uses that situation and the sin of the Pharaoh at that time by his own choice. And he uses that to protect his deliverer. The one who was going to be his instrument. The problem was at 40 years old, Moses wasn't ready. And he shows that by the, by the uh, impetuous acts that he does. By the fact that he just goes off and he just does what he's going to go do. And I don't know, he thinks he's going to kill every one Egyptian at a time. I don't understand. But he's not ready. And so God has a training ground for him. The problem is people are suffering in the midst of that. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't know. And it doesn't mean that God has forgotten. And it doesn't mean that God's not there. And it doesn't mean that God's not acting. He is, I would tell you, acting. He's aware of their sufferings. He's going to deliver them and bring them to the promised land. He is aware of your sufferings. And he's going to deliver you out of Egypt, out of the Egypt that you are in. He's going to deliver you out of that. And he's going to bring you to the promised land. And ultimately, that will be with him in heaven. Matter of fact, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you understand you've already been rescued out of your Egypt. You've already been rescued. I asked the worship team to work on a song for me that they're going to sing next week. That we're going to sing almost like as a theme song here. Because of what God's done. Right? He reminds them again and again he sees. And he reminds us again and again he sees. So... Simple message today. I just want to go over what you know. Okay, first thing that you know is that life is hard. Can I get an amen? Life is hard. Life is hard, right? God never told you it would be easy. 
Life is hard. But, and here's the good news. This is the beautiful news and the news that we have to remember. God hears our groanings. He knows our pain. And he knows our position with him. He knows who we are in Christ. He knows that we are his children. Again, if you know Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to get to Jesus. You need to get to him. Your sin is separating you from God, and you need him on your side. Not so that everything can become better. Not so that everything on earth will work out and you'll never get sick and you'll never, your car will never break down and the dog won't, you know, be sick on your carpet and the dog, you know, whatever. I mean, all those things. Not because of that, because they still might happen. But the reality is, is that God is even in the midst of those. And even in that, God is with you. He knows our position. He remembers who we are. Not only that, but God sees and he cares about what is happening to you. Well, but what is happening to me is so insignificant compared to what is happening to somebody else. I can imagine if I was God hearing Moses' groanings in the wilderness for 40 years because, oh, I haven't been able to go home for 40 years. Um, the people who are home are in slavery. Stop complaining. You're in a good place. God doesn't do that. God understands our heart and that it's fragile. And he doesn't go, shut up. Stop whining. He cares about every single thing that we have. And every single, he knows our pain. He knows the hurt. He knows how it's affected us. And he cares about that. He takes notice of that. And he loves us. And by the way, God's at work. He is acting on your behalf right now. You say, well, wait a second, I'm still in the midst of this. I know that. You might need to be in the midst of this. <laughs> you might need to be in the wilderness for another 40 years because God wants something better for you. I told you this a few weeks ago, you know, this lie that we're told that God loves us just, with, just the way we are. God loves us in spite of the way we are. He wants something better for you. I mean, he does love you. I get that. I'm not saying, well, God, well, you're saying he doesn't love me if I'm like this. No, no, he does love you, love you even, even like that, in spite of that. And he wants to bring you to someplace better. He wants you to bring you to someplace better for his kingdom, that you might be used for the glory of God, that you might be used to exalt him and to point others to him. Instrument for him. But we've got to know that God is there. We've got to remember that he knows. We've got to understand. We've got to catch this. I, I know it's a simple message. Let's move on. Let's talk about Moses. Let's talk about the miracles. Listen, God sees. God hears. God remembers. And God cares. God takes notice of us. He knows. And God is at work. So what do we do? <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, cast all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he can do something about it. Yeah, that says to other places. Because he's going to give you peace. That, that's Philippians. No, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Matter of fact, the verse right before that says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at the proper time. At the proper time, casting all your anxieties in that waiting period upon him because he cares for you. He's never left you nor forsaken you, and he never will. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you just for that reminder in the book of Exodus, Lord, a reminder that you indeed are God that you indeed are a God who hasn't forgotten about us in the wilderness, hasn't forgotten about us in Egypt. You're a God who loves us and cares for us, who remembers us, who takes notice of us. And Lord, you're a God who is acting. Therefore, I can, I can live out James chapter 1. I can consider it all joy 
when I encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of my faith produces endurance, so that endurance might have its perfect result, that I might be mature, perfect, and complete, lacking in nothing. Lord, you have greater plans for me than what I'm living now. How cool that is. How cool to know that there's not been a moment of time in my suffering or in my, uh, in my joy that you have forgotten, that you have left, and that you were not at work. So God, may I just cast all my cares upon you because you care for us. I love you, Lord. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.